For my fourth birthday, my parents took me and my brothers to Disney World in Florida. I remember being so enchanted by everything, the vastness and scope of it all, seeing these characters and places that I knew from films brought to life and being able to interact with everything. At the time, it really did feel like the most magical place on earth. Disney World is a place visited and loved by many, but director Sean Baker presents an alternative view to the childhood dreamland in his 2016 film, The Florida Project. The film follows Mooney, a mischievous six-year-old girl who lives with her mother Haley in a budget motel on the outskirts of Disney World, Florida. While Mooney and her friends spend their summer exploring their surroundings and causing trouble, Haley struggles to protect her daughter from the harsh realities of life. While this film celebrates the joy of childhood, it also highlights the hardships faced by those living on the fringes of society. But how is this careful balance achieved? A key aspect of this film is how it aligns the audience with the point of view of the child protagonists. I mean, it was very clear from the beginning, talking to Sean, that we wanted to tell the story from the children's point of view. And it was kind of our search was to, you know, to get back to this um, more naive or in, um, young POV where things, you know, even if it's a seedy hotel, it, it's still, you know, magical. And even though um, reality is not great, you, st you know, as a kid, you don't see that. You just see surprise and, you know, you see the world with different eyes. This is accomplished throughout the film with a number of visual techniques. In many scenes, the camera is kept close to the ground, staying at the height of the children and reflecting how they see the world. Adults are often framed from the waist down, with just their arms or legs shown on screen, and the buildings surrounding the children tower over them, exaggerating their size, which is further conveyed through the use of wide shots. As the children embark on their daily adventures, wide shots are used to accentuate the scale of their surroundings. The vast buildings they encounter are designed like Disney attractions and, while to the viewers the tacky and abandoned locations may highlight the contrast between the two worlds, to Mooney, they are places of wonder and adventure. The film's colour palette has been described by cinematographer Alexis Sabe as like ice cream, in that it is both sweet and sour, creating a contrast between the vibrant oranges and purples and the bitter greens. The brightness of the colours reflects Mooney's view of the world, childish and rose-tinted, creating a sensory overload like that of the Disney Utopia, while underneath the surface hides a layer of decay. Follow shots are another visual choice used in the film, the camera accompanying the kids on their summer antics, allowing the viewers to become a member of their gang. Rather than watching Mooney and her friends venture through these difficult spaces, we move with them, becoming immersed into a world of never-ending childhood. An alternative to this is the back-to-camera shot used on many occasions throughout the film. This choice of camera placement acts as a kind of follow shot in that the audience sees what the children see while maintaining the sense that we are with them and experiencing their perspective. Telling the story through the children's point of view is a powerful way to experience how they see and interact with their surroundings. However, that experience is complicated when temporality is taken into account. Katarzyna Paskiewicz believes that the Florida Project raises questions about time, non-productivity, and what counts as a good, happy, or successful life. This idea of non-productive or empty time is presented throughout the film, starting with the narrative itself. If there is a plot, I want it to be disguised, I want it to be buried, I want our three-act structures, uh, the three-act structure uh, to be, for the lines to be blurred, so it really would be almost hard to figure out if where where the second and third act begin um, and make this film more about character. It was really, it was really, we wanted to spend, we wanted the audience to spend the summer with these children. And if you think about your summers of, of your youth, it wasn't exactly, you know, plot driven. Instead of utilizing a conventional three-act structure involving a setup, confrontation and resolution, 
The majority of the film follows the minor events and happenings in the daily lives of the characters, reflecting the mundane and repetitive nature of their lifestyles. This is further reflected in the pacing of the film, with much of it being captured in long static or slow moving shots. Whether the children are sitting around or exploring their surroundings, the long duration of the shots give the sense that this isn't new for the kids, that they've experienced all of this before. The editing of the shots creates a rhythm of aimless wandering, of relentless motion, rather than the fast-paced energy that we would expect from childhood. Not only do we see the character's experience of time as empty and repetitive, but we also get a sense of stuckness through the use of motifs, in particular Mooney's favourite tree, which she describes as And it's tipped over And it's still growing Paskevich suggests that this imagery of the tree, growing sideways rather than upwards, reflects the rhythm of exhausted bodies striving to survive. Instead of moving upwards through society, Mooney and her friends are in a difficult position where their only option is to continue onwards in the same space they already occupy, that of hand-to-mouth living and invisible homelessness. The use of point of view and temporal experiences within the film demonstrates the joy of an unconventional and underrepresented childhood. However, when we take a look at the wider geographical setting, a deeper critique is identified. As mentioned previously, the Florida project takes place on the outskirts of Disney World in Orlando, with the title itself referring to one of the original names of the theme park before its opening in 1971. Along with the five other resorts around the globe, Disney World is seen as the epicentre of childhood, with their taglines including the happiest place on earth and where dreams come true, attracting visitors with the promise of joy and escape. While families with disposable incomes may choose to spend their summers in the magic of a Disney resort, like many people, Mooney doesn't have that option. By positioning her in the shadows of commodified childhood, the film highlights the cruel optimism created by the Disney Corporation, who withhold their utopian dreamlands from those who cannot afford it and may never be able to. Theorist Jean Baudrillard sees these Disney resorts as hyper-real, being presented as imaginary in order to make us believe that the rest is real. They are advertised as fantasy worlds containing imagery of the magical and futuristic, but what draws visitors is the social microcosm of idealised America created within the parks. The scale of the buildings and settings such as Main Street USA are designed to look realistic, creating a sense of reality that is a more desirable copy of the world outside. In this Florida project, however, the surroundings seem to have the opposite effect, with the bright and tacky buildings found on the outskirts of the resort bringing the magic of Disney into the real world. While these micro-versions of Disney locations may be far from the safe and clean spaces envisioned by Walt Disney, they still provide the motel children with an entertaining environment to explore and let their imaginations wander. The Florida Project has a consistent audio, visual and temporal style throughout, but director Sean Baker makes an interesting decision to completely shift what has been established in the final two minutes of the film. When social services show up to separate Mooney from her mother, she runs to her friend Jancy's motel room to say goodbye. The sudden shift in style occurs when Jancy grabs Mooney's hand and the two begin to run away. The once static 35mm camera work suddenly changes to shaky iPhone footage and a magical, uplifting, non-diegetic instrumental track begins to play, the first piece of music since the very opening of the film. Unlike the smooth follow shots of before, the camera moves frantically as it tries to keep up with the two girls. We question where they are going until people begin to appear. Families taking photos together, groups of people wearing Disney merchandise, and we realise where they are. Main Street, USA in Disney World. The camera then slows down, allowing the girls to run off into the Cinderella Castle in the Magic Kingdom until they can no longer be seen among the crowd. The sudden change of tone and pace within this sequence holds a sense of ambiguity, 
making us question if the girls achieved a typical Disney happily ever after. The reality of the situation is that this probably didn't happen, that the threat of Mooney's familiar childhood being taken away was so sudden and forceful that her only way out was through imagination. Despite this change in temporality and style, the point of view remains the same, that of the children's. The consistency of perspective throughout the film, taking us through moments of boredom and vulnerability, as well as joy and curiosity, reaffirms the idea that, no matter their position in society, children have the hope and imagination to make wherever they are the happiest place on earth.